All right, do we uh, have everyone yet, all the panelists, or no? I guess we'll get started with folks we have, because I don't wanna, I wanna be mindful of people's time. All right, uh, Shane, my last request, and maybe I have to do this on my end, which I just did, Never mind. so I can see everyone. Good to see everyone. I'm gonna go on video and I'm gonna get started. Hi everyone, good to see you. Connell, it's been a long time, good to see you guys. Hey. All right, hey Marie, it's good to see you. Okay, so let me, um, just formality purposes, I gotta read a specific script and then we'll go grant by grant. Shane, Kerry, you guys ready to go? I know we've been live for a little bit. Okay, thank you. For the record, everyone, my name is Andrea Campbell. I'm the Boston City Councilor for District Four. I am the chair of the committee on. Bo uh, I am the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. I am joined by, let's see, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, and Councilor Mejia, and I will get their order of arrival in a minute. Uh, this public hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city council slash city dash council dash TV. It will rebroadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN channel 82 and Verizon Fios ch channel 1964. We'll take public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you wish to testify, please email shane.pac, P-A-C at boston.gov to sign up. And if you are called, we will give you two minutes to offer your public testimony. You can also submit written testimony to ccc.ps at boston.gov. Uh, today's uh, hearing is on a whole host of um, grants and there are several of them that we will review. And I will read the dockets for the record. The first is docket 0999, which is FY 2020. Security and security, the security in the city's grant, then docket 1066, which is FY19 assistance to firefighters regional grant, and docket two more dockets, docket 1095, which is FY21 state 911 training grant, docket 1141, FY21 burn state justice assistance grant. We are joined by several members of the administration from the police department as well as the fire department. Um, and I think that's it. And so I'm not sure who's gonna speak to each grant. Um, so what I'll do is let's start with docket 0999 and then whoever's going to speak for that specific grant, if you could say your name and title for the record and then we'll allow you to say a few words and then I'll open it up to questions and then we'll do that for every subsequent grant. Um, thank you all for joining us again. Thank you to everyone from the administration. I know how busy both fire and police are. So I appreciate you being here and taking time out of your busy schedule. And we will jump right in starting with docket 0999. Uh, Marie, are you going to start or is there someone else who's specifically going to speak on this grant? Uh, um, can, can you share with me what 999 is? I'm sorry, I've got the summaries in front of Securing me. Securing the city's grant? Yes, actually, I'm going to introduce you to Captain Timmy Connolly. He is out of the Bureau of Field Services and he's overseeing this uh, Securing the Cities grant as well as playing the role of project coordinator until the project coordinator could, uh, can be hired. So I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Connolly. Perfect, thank you. And thank you, Captain Connolly, good to see you. Good to see you again, Madam Chair. Um, just as a high level overview of the Securing the Cities um, initiative, it's a program. It's a competitive, competitive grant issued by the Department of Homeland Security from the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. And it goes out to cities containing large populations and substantial critical infrastructure of a national interest. The grant provides equipment, training, and planning to develop a robust regional program aimed at the detection and interdiction of illicit radiological and nuclear material. Within our region, several thousand law enforcement officers will be trained and equipped to detect material that could be used to make a radiological dispersion device or improvised nuclear weapon. In simple words, a dirty bomb. Yeah. Uh, detection equipment is being deployed, will be deployed on personnel in vehicles and watercraft and vessels 
Boston's unique where we are, we're a port city, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to protect the port as well to, to effectively ring the region uh, with the radiological nuclear uh, detection capability while effectively enhancing public safety with newly deployed equipment to impact, and there will be no impact to daily operations uh, with this initiative. It's kind of a high level overview. Now. Thank you, Captain. Anyone else want to add anything or is that it? Sounds good. Um, Shane, if you could just quickly tell me the order of arrival for my colleagues and then I will uh, open it up to them for questions. Absolutely. So I have um, Councillor Flaherty, then Councillor Flynn, and then Councillor Mejia. Perfect. Councillor Flaherty, any questions on this specific grant? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Obviously, it's good to good see Timmy. And obviously, as uh, Boston was the, the launching pad for September 11th, and we also experienced the marathon bombing uh, where many uh, civilians and, and, and our first responders were uh, seriously injured uh, or worse. So um, anything we can do to, to be on the, on the front end of uh, being able to prevent uh, and detect, uh, whether it's dirty bombs, as, uh, as Tim had mentioned, or other, um, I guess, weapons of destruction, sign me up. Uh, this council has always had a great relationship with our first responders. And... I intend to maintain that uh, that great relationship. So I appreciate the work that Timmy's put in. I uh, appreciate his training and experience, and I trust his judgment uh, that this grant, um, if approved by the council, will be could put to good use and will be protecting the citizens of Boston and the visitors of Boston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Flynn. Thank you, uh, Councilor Campbell, and thank you to Captain Conley. Um, for providing that update and also Captain Conley for, the, for your work on a lot of these incredible difficult issues. So just want to say thank you to Captain Conley and like my colleague and friend, Council Flaherty mentioned, uh, it's an important subject um, and it, this grant will be very helpful. Um, I, had the, I have been trained on some of these issues spending a lot of time in my life in the military. Um, but I know how important it is to have highly trained professionals with the Boston Police, with the Boston Fire Department that work on these very difficult, um, challenging issues. So just wanna say thank you to the police and, and to the fire for always being there for the residents of Boston, as Council Flaherty said, especially during difficult times like the Boston Marathon bombing and in other difficult times as well. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. And, and I wanna quickly acknowledge that Councillor Asabi George has joined us. Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tim, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, that's what Flaherty said, so I'm gonna follow his lead. <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in all honesty, Councilor Campbell, I don't know much about this conversation, but I'm here to participate in the hearing. Um, I, you know, it sounds like we need this. So I'm going to defer to your leadership and to Tim. He knows what he's doing. And as long as, you know, the social and emotional well being of our people are intact during this particular process, I'm all in, I guess. And I'll defer to you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Sabi George, do you have any questions? I will ask a couple, but I'm gonna go through my colleagues first. Oh, no, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I don't, sorry to tune in a few minutes late too. Thank you. No problem. I'm gonna take it docket by docket. I guess the only thing just, uh, Councillor, oh, Councillor, Councillor Connolly, you're gonna run for office, uh, Captain is, um, can we break down specifically, right? It's a, I think it's a $2 million grant, if I have that correct, right? Yes, Madam Chair. No, right, uh, specifically what, uh, the breakdown is, and maybe there's um, a document. I know for some of the other grants, Maria usually breaks it apart and sends it over. Yeah. I would love to share that, but if we could specifically talk about what the $2 million would be used for um, and, um, and just how effective, you know, not only how necessary the resources are, but how it speaks, uh, how it correlates with the effectiveness um, of the department on these particular tasks. That would be great. Thank you. Um, yes, so it's $2 million for the first year to stand up and it's phase one, it's the engagement portion of, of the grant. And that includes standing up a, a program management office with regional capabilities. It's also um, developing um, several committees 
an executive committee, an operations committee, training and exercise committee, um, an equipment committee, and an information exchange, um, information sharing environment committee. Um, so, th so there's a lot of capabilities that we currently don't have. And Boston's very unique where we're so dense with our port and um, our medical nuclear medicine in the region that um, there is national interest in, in you know, what can, you know, low probability. And um, so we'd bring on a program manager. We'd bring on a finance person within the first year. Um, we would use the money to set up that office as well as to purchase equipment within the region, um, as well as set up tabletop exercises and full scale exercises as well, ma'am. Can I just of add- Of course, go ahead, Maria. Thank you. We're also giving 25 subcontracts to our regional partners because this is a regional capacity grant. So that would include other law enforcement agencies that need to come to the table and plan with us. And that would include resources for them to be able to utilize key staff to be able to participate in all of these committees. Um, and, and I could give you a list of regional partners, but they include local PD such as Chelsea, Everett, Revere, um, Quincy, um, Winthrop, and, and, and as I said, uh, Randolph. Uh, but it's important that people understand that this is a regional responsibility, not just a city of Boston responsibility. So with BPD as lead, we're taking on the leadership role of the whole region to coordinate the region because oftentimes when these type of threats come in, that communication needs to be seamless throughout the region. And so a large portion of the 2 million does go to subcontracts to 25 separate law enforcement agencies that are our regional partners. Um, I think other than that, um, he's done a great job uh, as well as with that, <laughs> describing what the budget can be used for, but we can also, as always, send you the one page abstract and some budget information on the budget itself. Um, and that would yeah, be great. That, yeah, that's it. Thank okay. you. And I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councillor Liz Braden. Uh, Councillor Braden, do you have a question on this specific grant? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next one. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I don't have any particular, uh, I think, uh, preparedness and uh, uh, coordination with regard to uh, incidents that involve nuclear. This is the nuclear radiation, the nuclear, that's the one that's we're talking right. about. Yeah. Right. Um, given the fact that MIT just across the river has a, a nuclear reactor on campus mm -hmm. over there, I think that these are things that we need to think about. So thank you so much. I don't have thank any further you. questions. And I'll go back to Council Mejia on the specific grant. Yeah, so oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, Councillor Campbell. I was just trying to get a better understanding and you always prompt me to think about things, so. Oh, no problem. Okay, Go sorry. Ahead. I'm just curious um, because it would, would you consider, Maria, are you guys thinking about doing like a PSA campaign to informing the public about what this project is and what it looks like in terms of rollout, just because I feel, like oftentimes just all these things happening in our community and we don't even know about them. And this is, this is a big deal, or it seems like it's a big deal, but I think there would be something worth considering in terms of just educating the public about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the role that they play in helping to keep us safe. Is there something to think about? Um, and then I just have two more things just to consider. One is I'm just curious about um, the cultural competency piece and, and just, um, in terms of who's at the table, because um, I know when we're talking about homeland, homeland security, oftentimes people feel a little bit nervous about um, just things. So I just want to throw that out there, Maria, just so you yep. can hear. Yep, I hear you. And, um, and then the last thing, uh, sorry, someone just scared me. I should have, um, the last thing is, thank you. The last thing that I want to just, but at the moment, Tico. The last thing is, is that um, a dashboard in terms of feedback um, so that we can continue to keep our constituents updated in terms of what you're doing, what the outcomes are, um, ways for us to have our goals and objectives clearly stated and, um, and a way for, for people to provide feedback. Just curious if those things we can consider. 
I, I can I can answer that. Yeah. Um, on the first part of your question, I think that I would strongly recommend that the mayor's office um, put something out. We are one of 13 cities that have the secure, excuse me, <clears throat> secure the cities uh, program, and most, if not all, of the other cities uh, out of um, the leadership uh, from the local governance had provided some type of a website where people can go to um, explain exactly what it is. And, and to the second component of your question, um, I think that's a great question for the information exchange and the information sharing environment committee, where we could have some type of, you know, there would be funding for some type of a website to answer exactly those questions uh, for transparency on, on what we're doing, um, how everything's being done and what goals and objectives have been met and which ones we're trying to reach and, and you know, metricies. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I would just second that. My answer to the question is that when we wrote the grant application, we had to really think critically and strategically about how we were going to meet each criteria that they had given us through the RFP. And so we've done a little thinking around the communication subcommittee as well as the other subcommittees because these are mandates. And so a lot of the uh, important uh, thoughts that you had just come up with, which was in three categories that I'm looking at right now, will actually be a call through that, through that um, uh, communication subcommittee. And I know that because when we had written the grant, a lot of what you're talking about was a requirement for us to respond to. And so I appreciate those questions and those things will be done in within the context of this very important communication uh, committee that falls under the overall structure of this regional um, office that we're talking about. And thank so, you. thank you. Yep. Thank you, Council Campbell. Thank you guys for answering those questions. No, thank you, Council Mejia. You can't hear a word I'm saying. Uh, I'm going to move on to the second docket, which is docket 1066, uh, FY19, Assistance to the Firefighters. Uh, it's the regional grant. Um, I'm not sure. Is that Kathleen? Are you going to speak to that grant? Yes, Madam Chair. Awesome. I'll have you do just an overview and, and uh, update for the counselors, and then I'll go back around to each counselor for any questions. Okay, sure. So this is Kathleen Judge. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Boston Fire I'm in charge of administration and finance. Um, this uh, grant is from AFG, which is Assistance for Firefighters, and it's to cover all of our COVID supply needs, and I'd be happy to go through what those details are, um, but primarily the, the largest of the 397,000 consists of respirators, but also eye protection, foot covers, gloves, coveralls, face masks, decon supplies, and hand wash. Um, and I'd be happy to supply that list if anyone's interested. Um, but we're very excited that we did get this reimbursement from um, AFG. That was gonna be one of my questions. It was a reimbursement. So thank you, Kathleen, for that, that clarification. Um, and if you could send over that list, that would be wonderful. I can also share it with co uh, council colleagues uh, who aren't, um, who, who are unable to attend today. Okay, I will do that. And now I will go in order. It looks like Councilor Flaherty maybe had to jump off. Councilor Flynn, any questions? No, no questions. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Thanks, Councilor Flynn. Uh, Councilor Mejia, any questions on this specific grant? Yeah, no, I'm just curious in terms of the PPE, um, who are we distributing them? Who's it, who's it going to? Is it gonna to be to our first responders, to the fire department? Where, where is it going? This, this actually goes to the firefighters. So as they need the protection when they're out in the field, this is the reimbursement from AFG, which is assistance for firefighters. So it goes directly to the uh, firehouses and the firefighters. Well, it should go without any problems there, Council Campbell. <laughs> I know we were actually, it's a, it's a good thing we got reimbursed for it too, which is, which is fantastic. Thank you, Council Mejia. Uh, Council Braden, do you have any questions on this specific docket? And no questions on this one, thank you. Thank you. Kathleen, anything you wanna add before I move on to the next docket? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I'm all set. And if it's okay with you, if I could just um, sign off while you move on, if that's okay. 
No problem. And I'll see you uh, later today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to move on to docket 1095, which is the FY21 state 911 training grant. Um, and this is in the amount of $457,671.85. Um, Maria, or I'm not sure who's going to speak from BPD on this specific grant. This is the F9, this is the state 911 training grant. Good this afternoon. Is you. Madam Chairperson, good afternoon. This is uh, Christopher Marconis, uh, Director of Quality Assurance for the Operations Division of the Boston Police Department. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of this grant. Uh, Thank good, you. After good afternoon and happy holidays to uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Um, Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, this grant is an annual grant that is awarded to the uh, the Boston, uh, the city of Boston. Uh, it's divided between the Boston Police Department, the Boston Fire Department, and Boston EMS to help defray the costs of training our um, 911 telecommunicators and dispatchers. Um, we have uh, continuing education uh, requirements in order to keep our staff certified. This fully funds that requirement set forth by the state. And it also uh, helps to pray the cost of any um, training, um, additional training that uh, we see is necessary for our telecommunicators and dispatches between the police department, the fire department and Boston EMS. So it is an annual grant. Um, Christopher, can you just uh, quickly speak to how many folks get trained with this, these resources, which of course we get every year um, and what that training sort of looks like, what the continuing training looks like just for, for sure. counselors. Thank you. So we have uh, here, in the, at least in the Boston Police Department side, which is the primary 911 call center for the city, uh, we have uh, about 100 employees up here, just over 100 employees that get trained uh, through this grant. Um, the uh, state requires uh, each telecommunicator to be um, attend 16 hours of con continuing education uh, classes per year in order to keep their certification. So those classes can be anything from in-house training here on rules and regulations and policy, to uh, classes for uh, dealing with um, uh, suicidal uh, callers or uh, de-escalation techniques. Um, some of them are also uh, geared toward, um, you know, stress and mental health for the actual employee. Um, so those, those, those courses are all uh, paid for through this grant. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'm now gonna go around and can save any questions I have towards the end. Uh, Councillor Flynn, any questions on this specific grant? Thank you. Thank you, Council Campbell. I have one question and I'm glad you brought it up regarding the stress that 911 operators um, go through, especially dealing with a lot of traumatic calls that come in. Yeah. Um, do, they, do they receive the, the right amount of, um, what, do they receive the right amount of time so that they can go to medical appointments, whether it's uh, mental health counseling or um, or making sure that we provide the best medical care and mental health services available to them, especially in, in the difficult environment that they work in. Yeah, thank you for the question, Councilor Flynn. Uh, that's a great question. We've been, we've been working on that for the last several years. Uh, we've actually uh, instituted a peer support program up here for all of our staff, all of our civilian staff, where they are able to avail themselves of, uh, of post-incident counseling uh, or debriefings after a critical incident. Uh, we also have resources available uh, through the On-Site Academy, which is, uh, is, is an academy that's funded through the state uh, that assists all first responders, policemen, firemen, uh, EMTs, also uh, now 911 telecommunicators. Uh, in, in dealing with uh, critical incident stress or uh, stress that they may bring home due to the fact, due to their job uh, and their exposure to critical incident stress on the job. Uh, we also have uh, available, we, we do a lot of training regarding um, emotional distress and critical incident stress on the job here through this grant. Uh, so that, that is a component of their training and it's also a component of the peer support team. Uh, we're, we're looking at some other alternatives as well to increase that amount of training because it is it is so critical. It's 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 a it's a it's been um, you know underfunded and, and, and it's been in such a need for so many years. And it's being recognized now nationally as something that needs to uh, needs to be there. 
Thank you, Chris, for that response. It was very helpful. Uh, no further questions, Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Councilor Mejia? Yes, um, just two questions. One, I just, well, actually one is a question and the other one is a statement. My cousin, Brenda Ortiz, used to work um, for the 911 and she was- I know operator. Brenda, sure. That's my cousin. Yeah, very, very good employee. Yeah, she worked there for a long time. Um, yeah. And I, I know that she did really well there. And then I have another colleague of mine, um, Sylvia Correa. Is, oh, I know uh, so, yep. Yeah, so we know the same people. So I'm dropping yes. names here. I'm dropping <laughs> names. Um, but, you know, these questions are really in, in to support um, their work. Uh, yeah. and, and I know that um, it, handling these calls, as Councilor Finn said, is, is definitely very stressful. And yeah. oftentimes we carry that trauma. I'm home because um, you can't just leave it at work sometimes. And so I'm just curious in terms of this um, training, what, can you just talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the trauma response type of training that, you're, that you'll be able to provide? And then I'm also curious around customer service because sometimes I know it's so stressful yep. and I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of leading with empathy and, and when there's so much going on, like what kind of skills are provided to people so that um, they can maintain their cool and, and walk people through yep. oftentimes difficult challenges? Excellent questions. Uh, so uh, the, the training funds help us, uh, they, they actually help get the peer support program up here in operations off the ground. We were able to train, uh, matter of fact, you mentioned one of the members of the, of the team, Sylvia Correa, she's actually on the peer support team up here in operations. Um, those funds actually paid to send our folks to a three-day training to get certified in, in, in peer counseling. Um, how to identify signs of, of distress amongst their coworkers? How to identify, uh, after a tough call, how, coping skills, how, how to deal with the trauma, how to deal with the stress involved in, in taking a call from somebody um, that, that's having a bad day, uh, you know, having one of the worst days of their life. Um, so, so that training, though, these training funds do help for that. They also help. We, we do training for empathy, uh, customer service, uh, for our 911 telecommunicators, because it is vitally important because they are the first, the first, they are the true first responder. Whereas the, I mean, it doesn't get any more basic than 911 for government, right? That's what people think of when they think of, I need help. They dial 911. They need to access their local government. We need to be responsive. We need to be professional. We need to have great customer service skills. We need to be able to de-escalate situations over the phone. And sometimes it's 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 easier said than done, but it is a challenge. And we do offer extensive training on that. And we're actually uh, getting ready to embark on a new customer service class this uh, spring. So uh, hopefully uh, March, I believe, it's going to be starting to uh, to kind of go over some of these things. And again, it's constant. It's ongoing training. Um, all of that is uh, funded through the training grant. Uh, our telecommunicators get it, and, and the state requires a certain amount of these classes every year. Yeah, that's great. And then, Chris, I'm just curious, uh, uh, Council Campbell, one more question. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, yeah, okay. So I'm also curious in terms of customer service um, surveys. Like, do you ever use uh, an opportunity to survey how people are experiencing? Um, the 911, and then based on what you learn, are you able to then share with your employees on how, what areas of growth? Do, do you do any surveying to? So we don't do any surveying of the public uh, as of yet. We do have a pretty comprehensive quality assurance program, which I run. Um, and what we do with that is it's a non-disciplinary approach, primarily uh, reviewing calls and incidents. And what we do is we review the call taker or the dispatcher's um, interaction with the public. And through the recordings, we're able to determine do they ask the appropriate questions for the incident being reported? How is their customer service skills? Uh, how are the customer service skills? All of that is reviewed. Uh, but the call takers are then, uh, we review those incidents with them, uh, particularly on the 911 call taking side and help them, like you said, coach them. What went right? What went wrong? What can we do better? How can we improve it? And kind of hone their skills in on, on, on what their job is. Um, and it is beneficial. It's very, it's very eye-opening at times. It's, it's one thing to take the call and then sometimes after, after the uh, fact to listen to it and see how you sound to the public and how the call came across. Um, it is. It's a good training tool. It's a good, it's a good coaching tool. 
Thank you. And um, Fernando from the mayor's, um, the IG contact is here, I think, on the call. I'm going to volunteer myself when you do the customer service training. If you want me to come in as a guest speaker, I would okay. love to do that. Just Sure. I would love to. Uh, that, those, that's, a, that's one of my pet projects, I guess, if you will, is just helping people um, with communication skills. And so if, if you want me to come in to be a speaker, I'm volunteering, okay? I love it. <laughs> we'll you. take you up on that. Yeah, that's Thank fantastic. You. Now, of course, every counselor is going to have to go. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to well, have to get in with Councilor Mejia, put on our mask and get there. At, no, that's, some, at that's, some point, once this COVID settles down, we'd love to have members of the council come up for a tour and see the operations center and, and see how it operates. See, see how no, it, that it would works. be great, Chris. Yeah. That would be great. Um, one question I have um, before I then turn it over, I think, to Councilor Flaherty, who came back to join us, is obviously, and this connects actually to Councilor Mejia's work on the council, as we're talking about, you know, the fact that police are have to handle so much, right? As we're mm -hmm. talking about policing reform and trying not to create this us versus them mentality or tone, right. really hearing from our officers that they have to do everything it seems like mm -hmm. and so some of the conversations before the council are around how do we um, use our 911 system to create in partnership with the 311 system to create pathways for callers right when they're calling about specific things that it's not always right. going to police or always going to officers mental health calls certain types of calls maybe being redirected somewhere else so i'm curious mm -hmm. um chris from your vantage point where you sit um some of your thoughts on that and specifically on the resource side of things, if you've given thought, maybe you haven't, on just how that would even work currently with, with your current system in resources. I, I mean, it, it is, it's, we're, 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 we have ongoing discussions now about um, alternative routing for 911 calls or incidents that are called in across the city. Um, I mean, people call 911 for everything. So mm -hmm. it could be from, you know, uh, something as minor as somebody cut them off in, in traffic and they're, or they're, they're uh, they have a you know a pet peeve about something going on on the on the, on the mm -hmm. corner, whether it be a street light out or something going on in the neighborhood that would be better addressed by three one one, the mayor's office, or some other city mm -hmm. department. Um, I, I will say, as a matter of uh, policy now, if it's a non police matter, if it's something of that nature, we do direct folks to three one one. It would be more appropriate to call and deal with either code enforcement if it's something going on in their neighborhood mm -hmm. and. Um, a building permit issue or a noise issue that's that's non-criminal in nature or, or that's you know not in the middle of the night where it's loud music or something or a loud party um, but we are having conversations also around the mental health aspect of the calls what to do with folks that call 911 that are in a bad way and um, is that you know they don't need maybe they don't need an emergency ambulance maybe they don't need a police car maybe they just need somebody to talk to maybe they need a counselor maybe we can get them services without sending a police unit and tying up a police unit or tying up an emergency ambulance. Um, so we are having those discussions internally now between Boston EMS, Boston police and the mayor's office. Uh, so lo those discussions are ongoing, but I, we're always, we're always open to suggestions. Um, we take six, over 600,000 incoming 911 calls a year here in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, they all primarily come into Boston police headquarters first. We triage them. If it's a fire related call, we transfer it over to Boston fire. If it's a medical call, it gets transferred over to Boston EMS. Um, and, and it's busy. It's, it's hectic. Um, our, our staff works hard. They're all uh, great people. They, most of them come from the city, the city residents. They, mm -hmm. they understand the neighborhoods they live in. They live in the neighborhoods here in the city. Uh, they understand the challenges. So it, that helps. Um, but we're, we're always trying to do things a little bit differently and, and look at how we can be more efficient and more responsive to the community. No, thank you for that. And, and I think it's an ongoing conversation um, over here, of course, on the council side too. So this is all fantastic. And um, thank you, of course, for all that you do and of course, all of, all of your callers as well and, and, and your staff. Um, I just want to go back to Councillor Flaherty. Do you have any questions, Councillor Flaherty, on this specific grant before I thank move you, on Madam to the Chief. last one? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief comment. I had to step no away problem. for a quick second. I just want to commend Chris on the great work that he does and the team that he has over there. And we've got a great 911 system here, very fast paced, but we're well trained in the feedback we get uh, across the board um, when folks call 911, whether it's for uh, emergency medical service, whether it's for uh, fire or for, or for police and or for a whole other variety of reasons. I'm sure Chris can give you a litany of uh, reasons why people call 911 sure. and, um, 
and they keep good track of it, but it, the range is from A to Z. And so I just want to commend uh, Chris uh, and uh, the men and women that work for uh, our 911 system. So thank you. And I, and I will be, I want to go on record as supporting this grant. Thank you, Madam President, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, we'll move Anytime. on to the, to the, thank you. We'll move on to the last grant, uh, which is uh, docket 1141. This is FY21 Burn State Justice Assistance Grant, which I know we've received in the past. Uh, so who is speaking on that one from BPD? Deputy Gaines. Hi Gaines, how are you? Hi, how are you? Doing well. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent for being here. Um, I'll let you speak to it and then I'll do the same thing. Go back around and ask any uh, questions from myself, but also my council colleagues. Okay, thank you for having me and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, this is a grant uh, through the state police uh, that'll provide funds for the Mass State Police and the Boston Police to share and work in partnership. The initiative will focus on investigations to suppress gun violence, focusing efforts on the groups and the individuals that are driving the firearm violence, as well as patrolling hotspot areas where incidents involving firearms continue to occur. Uh, this will also uh, enhance community trust. The mission is to continue the work with our community partners, continue to improve on prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies. I'm in my 26th year with the department, so I, I've seen firsthand um, the destruction uh, that firearms bring to many families within this community. Uh, it is clear that even during the pandemic, the city is seeing a problem with firearms. Uh, as we've seen, you know, the number of firearms seized, the number of homicides, and the number of people shot continue to rise. Uh, there's a lot of victims and a lot of families being affected. So, you know, I believe these funds are crucial and necessary to deal with this issue. Thank you, uh, Deputy Superintendent. Um, just a few questions and then I can always save the rest for the, the next next round. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously this grant, we've gotten it before, right? It's an annual grant. Yes. Um, and what's the difference, just curious on this one, what we received the year before versus now? Has it gone up or down? I don't have that information, what we received prior. Maria, do you by chance know what we might have received prior to this? I'm, this text, I'm texting Jason as we okay. speak. Um, this is a pass through, no so the money goes directly to state, Mass State Police. Now we get a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So let me, Jason's responding. <laughs> hey, so, Jason. <laughs> so uh, Jason's basically saying it's not an annual grant. Um, oh. Yeah. And so. I thought this can... was an annual grant. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think it was either. Then I thought maybe I was wrong, but I was right because um, Jason, let me know that this was a, this is not an annual grant. Um, this is I, what I recall is this is the first time we've received this amount of money from the Mass State Police. We do get other uh, Mass State Police funding, but it's a different grant. Is so this the I first think time we've received this, this, this one? It, we call Jason, so at least I can answer No problem, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go on to some other questions and then go around and we can come back. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn in right now. No problem. So, you know, this, this grant, I was just, um, obviously we're talking about not only guns, but gun violence and actually seeing an uptick right now, right? In the city of Boston, unfortunately, Correct. which of course is sad on all fronts, including on our police department side and, and public safety agencies that have to respond and and also a community-based organization. So Deputy Superintendent, if you could just talk about uh, a little bit more around, you know, this is, the summary is always about how this is supposed to allow us to uh, sort of address specific impact players, certain people, who are those players? How does this, how do these resources specifically allow us to do that? What's the strategy and, and mechanisms um, we, we use in order to, to reduce um, gun violence, particularly as we're looking at an uptick right now? Well, obviously we're, we're gonna utilize, you know, information that we receive and, you know, how we get it through sources and individuals we speak to. And, you know, the individuals that are obviously driving the violence and, you know, continually engaging in activity with firearms, we're obviously gonna focus our efforts on those individuals. Um, 
in as far as, you know, if we get information that individuals are possessing firearms, obviously we're gonna, you know, initiate investigations to determine whether that information is credible and if it's reliable. And, and if it is, then obviously that, that investigation will go further and it, it, it could progress to, you know, search warrant arrest or something along those lines. And the grant talks about, you know, targeting specifically um, violent impact players. Wh who are the impact players? What's the number of impact players that we're talking mm -hmm. about? Is this work done in coordination, right, with the SSYI grants, the other grants that are also sort of targeting impact players, or is this different in a different set of individuals? I believe it's probably a lot of the same individuals involved. Um, but it's not necessarily gang members, it's, it's any individuals that are engaging in firearm violence. I mean, we're not just focusing on gang, gang individuals, it's all individuals utilizing firearms. Okay, that would be, that would be just helpful as I can, for, I can, for me to share with council colleagues, um, not only because, you know, the description is so general, right? It says it's targeting violent impact players. Right. You know, what does that actually mean? If we could get a, a bigger or a longer description on that so I can share with council colleagues, particularly those who had to jump off earlier who couldn't attend. Um, and then Maria, if we could get, obviously this is a one-time grant, the first time we're receiving it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, we can, you can, Jason can follow up. And then the second, my last question, and I can wait for the next round is, it's $300,000, right? So what's the specific breakdown of where the dollars go? So I can answer, I just got off the phone with Jason. And, and basically, this is the state's JAG grant that they subcontract to us. And that's why we have never got it before. In the past, we received this JAG grant as well. So when you think of the federal JAG grant, the federal one is the one that pays for the domestic violence advocates. They pay for um, a new hub coordinator and they pay for some technology right. folks that allow us to do um, the, the incident database work with the new Mark 43. Um, that goes directly to us. Uh, this grant is, is actually the Mass State Police grant that they subcontract to us. And those funds go towards, as you know, as we've already discussed, uh, those involved in guns and gang activity. They are, that's a broader group than the SSYI database group. The database group is the same, but it's a smaller, more targeted group than my assumption is the broader group of people that will be um, the work of both Mass State Police and the Boston police because some of those activities will be cross jurisdictional line activities. Um, the, the, the subcontract that went to the BPD is for overtime for the gang unit to participate in mass state police multi jurisdictional activities. Uh, some of these activities will obviously get integrated between guns and gangs and, and also trafficking often. Um, in other crime categories. So, um, and so the work is not only multi-jurisdictional and cross, crosses, crosses lines between um, sort of greater Boston communities, but they're not, it's my assumption that it's not just targeting just the guns, it's more widespread. It's the connection between the guns, the gangs, the drugs, the trafficking and other criminal enterprises. So I, that's frankly because it's this first grant and it's a pass through and we didn't write it. That's all I know about it. So we'll get you the answers to your other questions. Um, it, yeah, no, just, but if we could get a breakdown of the 300,000, right? If summer's used for overtime for the gang unit, I think folks would want to know that. And then if yeah. where else the dollars go in the department to respond to all of this. And my last question is, um, you know, there's shot spotter technology in here. I'm assuming a percentage of the dollars go to that technology, the shot spotter technology as well? No. No, nothing no. in here goes, to, okay. No. Sometimes some of the descriptions are not, they're almost yeah. too vague. Okay. And again, this description is vague because it's a subcontract that we received. Um, in order to answer some of these questions, we'd have to get a copy of the grant that the Mass State Police wrote because it's their grant. 
Um, okay. I'm gonna um, now go on to um, Councillor uh, Flaherty. Do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. That was a great explanation by uh, Maria. It's good to see her. And obviously, the criminal enterprise piece was the important part for me. I, um, it's not often that the states are throwing around grant money, so we should take it when they when they offer it. But I know that we've done a number of joint uh, stings and uh, and there's been a number of joint task force. Uh, most recently, the one that netted a lot of impact play has got a lot of drugs and guns uh, off the street, and there was a significant trafficking, um, human trafficking component to it. So uh, great to see uh, our uh, different jurisdictions and law enforcement agencies working together and collaborating. Um, and so if this uh, continues to foster that, then uh, I would like to go on record in supporting it. It's also great to see Deputy Gaines. We go back to the sort of the mid to late 90s and my time in the DA's office. So I know he's got a front row seat and has led the effort uh, in this part um, in the space as well. And if is there a way, uh, Deputy Gaines, you can tell us how many guns have been taken off the street uh, in, in this calendar year or over the last uh, couple of years? In, uh, and have, have you seen an increase uh, during COVID uh, with folks sort of... Um, with places closed and people pent up into or throughout the summer. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, large gatherings. I mean, for this year, we're, we're over 400 firearms seized um, for the year, which is up from last year. And if you want to break it down by homicides and people shot for 2020, there's been 45 homicides by firearms. That's up from 28 in 2019. And as far as non-fatal shootings this year, it's been 226. That's up from 157 last year. So the numbers are definitely up. It's significant, Deputy. And are we seeing, when I was in the DA's office, it was the stashed weapon phenomenon. And for those that, uh, for my colleagues that are on, uh, more often than not, you, you know, at the street level, you wouldn't take a gun from someone, particularly if you didn't know uh, whether or not it was connected to a body, say. Uh, right. And they were pretty meticulous on that. However, we had this sort of stashed weapon phenomenon going on. Uh, when I was in the DA's office, it sort of stopped. And then we started, we started to tick back up again where uh, it really didn't matter. Um, it used to be the old days, you'd sort of scrape off the serial number, et cetera. But um, people would be reluctant to take a weapon from someone else if they didn't know the history of the weapon. And then all sort of rules went out the door. And, and, and we had kids stashing weapons in neighborhoods and trash cans and under stoops and in alleyways uh, so that they were readily accessible in the event the situation arose and oftentimes would recover a weapon. Um, and you know this deputy because we had worked together on it, but would recover a weapon and it had multiple bodies attached to it. So right. can you maybe just briefly describe as to whether or not sort of the stash weapon phenomenon, if that's still taking place out in the streets in, or is there any sort of code around when people are sharing weapons? I mean, I would say you, you still have that to some extent, but I, I just think that there's so much more weapons out there right now. Um, it, it does still occur, but I would say not as much. So the volume is such as that, um, you know, that's uh, no need to be picky, I guess. It, you, can get, you can get readily, uh, guns are readily available. available yeah. as well. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate the work you're doing, Deputy, and getting as many guns as possible off the street. Illegal firearms obviously are a big piece of this. And so um, my hope is that uh, this grant money, uh, if approved, and I'll be supporting it, uh, will go to uh, giving you the tools uh, that you need. And obviously, and, and we'll support uh, the efforts that Maria had outlined in her presentation. So thank you for your efforts. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Maria, go ahead. I see you raising your hand. Yeah, so uh, I've been on and off with Jason, and basically he's saying that all 300,000 is for overtime, uh, that there's okay. a certain number of uh, gangs, the only specialized unit within the BPD that will be able to use this overtime money is the gang unit, uh, the, the, in that uh, it will be um, utilized in in ways that conform with Boston Police protocol and policy around overtime use um, and recorded succinctly in that manner. So those are the answers to the two questions that you've had. And I just wanted no, to that's, say that's that. That's very helpful. And just, you know, when you're talking about $300,000 for overtime um, for that particular unit, how many officers does that entail? Just in terms of number of officers, um, I, I, does, that, does, that, does that entail obviously working in partnership with the state police? Yes. So I'm going to ask Deputy Gaines because I, I think I, I think I recall it was about 120 estimated, but the name, the numbers changed. So I thought that the um, deputy could answer that question. Okay. Right now within the uh, youth violence strike force, there's 55 officers. In my understanding, there will be seven, uh, nine troopers assigned over here total. And that's, 
very helpful. And, you know, there, just I wanted to flag, there's a separate hearing and conversation that will come up next year around the gang database, the brick, FIOs, and that unit, the gang unit, or the Youth Violence uh, Task Force, um, Youth Violence Strike Force, because there's just a lot of questions, right, around how you get into the gang database, what the information looks like, et cetera. So I just want to flag that it's ongoing. The conversation will also probably go into an area where there are folks who suggest, you know, do we need the unit? What does it look like? Should we break the unit apart and send those officers back to the district? There's a whole host of conversations, right? And so that hearing will be an opportunity to delve into, I think, um, some of what we're talking about here. So I just want to flag that because they, they continue to be ongoing conversations in separate spaces from the grant, but just wanted to have specifics around what the $300,000 would be used for. Um, I have one more, a couple more questions, but I want to be fair to my colleagues. So uh, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Campbell, Madam Chair. Um, and just have one question for the deputy. Um, thank you, deputy, for, you, for your leadership in this city. Um, what are we doing in terms of trafficking guns across state lines? Um, and are we doing, is, is part of that, those efforts working together with other police departments in various cities and in states, but what are we? What are we? What's exa What exactly are we? Are we doing? And how can we? How can we improve that? Um, that process. I mean, we have t task force members assigned to an ATF task force, who they would deal with those issues. Um, we wouldn't deal with that at the Youth Violence Strike Force. Any type of gun trafficking issue would be dealt with by the ATF task force. Are we? Are and, we but, I, but I'm sure they are addressing issues and dealing with those type of issues, yes. They absolutely are. Are we, are we still seeing a lot of guns coming into our city from various states across the country? Absolutely, because they're just so much easier to obtain in some of these other states. You know, some of these states you can purchase it with just an identification and, and, you, and you can buy several guns and it's not a, like, we do a pretty good job in this state. Everything's documented, everything's monitored, and every transaction gets put into the computer. A lot of states aren't operating like that. So these guns, you know, they'll get people to go buy them. They'll go buy five or 10 of them, and then the guns just disappear. They report them as stolen, and then they're out in the wind to, to be involved in crimes and things. I think part of the solution, obviously, is that we, we have stricter gun policies at the federal level so that trafficking guns is, um, you know, in, in, across state lines um, is more difficult, but I know it's more of a state, a, a federal issue. But again, just want to say thank you, um, Deputy, and to um, BPD on the important work on, on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, we do, like I said, we do a pretty good job here. It's, it's these other states, like you said, there needs to be some sort of a federal mandate that kind of controls and dictates how these firearms are dealt with. And it's, it's just not in place right now. Yeah, just as just as an example, I, I I lived in various states across the country serving in the military, and you could walk into stores mm -hmm. and you'd see um, guns and rifles on the wall as if you were buying, you know, sporting equipment like a, a basketball yeah. or a baseball glove, or they'd be they'd be in the same section like that. So it was pretty coming from the northeast or coming from Boston. Um, pretty shocking to say the least when you when you see that how easy it is to get legal guns in a lot of states across the country yes it is thank you deputy um thank you councillor campbell uh thank you councillor flynn council mejia hi uh, yes um thank you uh, madam chair and thank you um deputy superintendent um, it's good to see you. I will have to say in full disclosure, I have some reservations about this particular um, a docket, uh, mainly because there's just so much distrust in communities of color already as it relates to racial profiling. And I'm just curious about, you know, how this particular grant helped to increase um, 
the trust uh, within communities of color. And I also am curious about how oftentimes the gang unit um, racially profiles uh, black and brown young men, Muslims. And so I'm just curious about how all of this is being taken into account. And this is one that I'm not solely enthusiastic about. While I do care about safety, I just I have some high reservations in terms of the racial profiling situation and anything that's going to continue to further um, impact um, those who have already been targeted by the gang unit makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm just curious if you could speak to some of that. No, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear your concerns, but clearly based on these numbers, we have an issue in some of these communities with firearms. And, you know, it, as far as the gang unit, the way we're conducting our investigations, it, it's based on information that we receive and information that, that we further investigate. And that's how we're, we're conducting our investigations. It's, it's not based on your race or your color. It's based on the information that we receive and the information that we're able to develop. Um, you know, if you're participating in firearm violence uh, it, it, and you come across, you know, it, it, into our sites as an individual being involved in this, then we're, we're going to investigate that. Um, I mean, we, we go where the violence is at and that's what we investigate, that those are the individuals that we're investigating. I mean, that's, that's what dictates our investigations. Yeah, but so I guess I would just have to just, uh, in terms of just a follow-up around that, is that there's so many unsolved murders in our neighborhoods. And so I'm just curious if this, if this, if these investigations, you know, what, what, how are we producing results? And, um, I'm just wondering what that looks like in terms of uh, return of our investment, in terms of capturing um, some of these uh, usual suspects. What do you mean as far as furthering from these firearm investigations, what, what kind of results they'll produce? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, because I, I you know, there's still like, there, there's all of this money being poured into um, gang intelligence and this, that or the other, but we don't see the outcomes um, in our communities. There's still a lot of unsolved murders. There's still a lot of, uns you know, where did the gun come from? All of those things are still unanswered in many cases. And so if this fund is supposed to help support that work, I'm just curious about, you know, the, the success. Well, like I said, over 400 firearms were seized. I mean, how many homicides did, did that stop? That, that clearly is, having some sort of an impact on the violence. I mean, for every gun that sees it, nobody's gonna get shot with that firearm. But, but I hear you though, um, you know, some of these cases, they, they, they do not get solved. And that, that's for many reasons, maybe there's just a lack of evidence. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not, not, just not every case is solvable, but you know, I, I think the investigators here do the best that they can. I really do So who are we that. receiving the information from? What information? You talking about when you talk about you know who you're determining who you're following up with you know who are you tracking is this information coming from the community where where is this information coming from it could be coming from the community could be coming from confidential informants could be coming from sources you know information that the officers are able to find on their own it's going to be coming from a, a numerous different sources obviously yeah, I, I think to Cam, um, Councillor Campbell's point in terms of just like all of the concerns that exist um, in our community in regards to the myth, the, the, the mistrust um, and people not feeling, uh, I just like this, this, this particular docket, Councillor Campbell, I'm gonna struggle with in terms of, I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. the only one that's gonna be voting on it, but I do have some significant reservations in terms of just what, what and I worked, you know, uh, deputy superintendent in the '90s. I was, I was. Yeah, I know Councillor Flaherty talks about being a DA at that time, but at the time in the '90s when violence was in its all-time height here in the city of Boston, I used to do youth uh, violence prevention um, during the Boston Miracle. Right, so um, I understand the ebbs and flows of of violence in in the Boston area, and I do believe that if we're that intervention and um, prevention goes a long way. 
And, and I think that if there was a way for us to really pour more resources into the intervention, into the prevention side of, of this, that we might be able to really move the needle around, um, around uh, decreasing violence in our community. So that's one of the things that I'll be advocating for is more on the prevention end, um, just because I feel like that is where uh, these resources are needed. Thank you. Well, I, I can tell you that we, we do work with Talia Wright Rivera from SOAR and the street workers and uh, Leroy Peoples. Okay. And, you know, they, they do have people out there and, you know, we have weekly meetings and discussions and, you know, they try to get ahead of violence and, you know, they try to mediate situations that, you know, uh, social media beefs and neighborhood beefs that are going on. And, and they're definitely trying to, um, you know, to get these individuals to put their guns down and to make them think a different way and to not, all, to not necessarily resolve the issues with violence. Um, and, and, and they do a very good job. But in the event that, you know, we're unable to, you know, mediate it or, or, or change these individual minds, um, you know, sometimes investigations are necessary. Well, I will, I will add, you know, Council Mejia, I appreciate the points you're raising because this was the only grant that I had questions to and why I wanted to flag that separate conversation around, you know, the hearing that Council Arroyo and I will, will do together. Um, but I'm sure Council Mejia and others will, act, you know, definitely uh, participate and be a part of is, you know, questions from community around the recent FIO data, right? Um, that questions from community around BRIC and how you get into the gang database. There's so much, there's so much people don't know around that point system, how you get in, how you get off, et cetera. Definitely a conversation around that. And there's definitely questions around um, this particular task force and this particular gang unit and, and whether or not it's necessary. And of course, I've spoke to folks who are in the department who say it's absolutely necessary. There's a certain expertise that officers have in this unit that others don't around um, dealing with folks who are in gangs. But then the question is, well, how effective? So there's a lot of questions which will continue in a separate hearing. Um, but I wanted to get you know, more specifics on this. It sounds like it's a one first time grant we've received from the state police. It's $300,000. It's all used for overtime for officers in this unit, um, which I have concerns around, around right? Why, why do we need uh, $300,000 to cover overtime? You know, what are, what, what's the restrictions where you, from where you sit, Deputy Superintendent, as to why mm -hmm. this amount has to go to overtime? I think that connects to this larger conversation we're, ha we're having around overtime budget, how, it, the fact it's not sustainable for years to come. So would love to hear your perspective on that or Maria, if you have a, a perspective on just all of this going to overtime, um, which I think is concerning to many as we talk about reducing the overtime budget. And I'm doing some hearings with Councillor Bach right now where we're seeing how challenging that is. I mean, I can just, from my uh, vantage point, um, you know, crime isn't necessarily nine to five. And, you know, sometimes, you know, to do investigations, it's outside of our work hours. I mean, we typically work from 8 a.m. to 11.45 p.m. We have two shifts here. Um, you know, a lot of times the individuals that are engaging in this type of activity, they're not around during those hours. Um, you know, they, they come out later at night, but we may have information that there's gonna be some sort of retaliation overnight. So uh, we we want to put extra resources out there during those hours to cover that in the event that, you know, there is a retaliatory act and we can cover that. So I'm just saying, you know, sometimes investigations and in the need to put extra patrols or does fall outside the, the time of our regular hours. And how does this connect with the administration's goal or, you know, trying right now they committed to 12 million, trying to reduce 12 million, which actually because the overtime budget is going up, they have to, realize more than that in order to get to that commitment. So how does, right. this, how does this tie into to the, you know, the administration's attempt to save money on the overtime side of things? And then my second question is, you know, Maria, are these dollars already spent? Is this a reimbursement? What's the structure of, of the grant? So with regard to your first yeah. question, um, the Boston Police Department at this point in time, as you know, is attempting to look in, various um, units and um, other divisions to lower, lower overtime costs. Uh, this $300,000 doesn't come from the city of Boston operating budget. We didn't write the grant and put $300,000 into the grant in overtime for ourselves. 
This was something that came to us from the Mass State Police because of the way in which they work with our gang unit to do these type of um, investigations. And sometimes these investigations include surveillance and sometimes that surveillance has to take place after midnight. And so I, I, I concur with you that the BPD right now administratively is you know, exhaustively trying to figure out how to save on annual overtime costs. Uh, I, I'm sure you already know much of the reasoning for why the overtime is where it is, is because the Boston police itself has, um, has less police offices than it historically has had. And so we are mandated to cover certain things um, that range from anything from protests to, to, to rallies to other types of coverage. And so when you have less police offices available, um, you need the, the use of overtime is to cover mandates. And so that's why we struggle internally right now with increasing overtime because some of the stuff is mandated by law that we cover. And so that's what we're struggling mm -hmm. with right now internally. And then as we're working on this internally and trying to figure out how to save in cost in this category, we get this grant that from the outside that says, this, this is our rules, this is our money, we're giving you this money to do these uh, cross jurisdictional activities as well as a city of Boston activities with us. Um, and well, so my we last two questions, um, yeah. I, I'm looking at the time, I know we've gone over, but my last two questions on that partnership, right, between state police and BPD, which is obviously, I get it, you got to work in partnership with law enforcement all around you. Um, you know, the, the description says it's to develop and document intelligence and, in, and to enhance community trust. But we've also talked a lot about the resources being used to get guns off the street. So curious, you know, how much of the activity includes getting guns off the street and what, what pieces of it include enhancing community trust and how do we do that with this unit, right? Um, how do we do that with this unit um, in this partnership with state police? So well, I can try, go ahead. I did wrap. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Well, a lot of times the work that we do, um, especially in, I, I could just think of the top of my head in Grove Hall, is there's hundreds of community groups that come to our meetings. We go to their meetings. We share information with them. They share information with us. They tell us what they want us to do in many of these neighborhoods. And so Oh, and so, and they want answers and they want to know that, you know, when I told you that there's serious gang activity and certain people in this neighborhood can't leave their front doors, they want to, they want to know that they're being heard. So many times um, folks from the, from the uh, Youth Violence Strike Force are attending these meetings consistently and having those back and forth conversations with not only community groups and residents, but community nonprofits. Um, and so I, particularly for this grant, I, I, I can't make the assumption that this particular task force work is also going to continue to do what we do regularly by nature in, the, in, in hours in which community meetings take place. Um, but when I hear building trust, and I hear that in partnership with what the work of the Youth Violence Strike Force is, there's a range of activities that the Strike Force uh, participates in that that are about communication with community groups and building trust. And I assume with these funds that will continue to take place. Um, however, you know, again, not we didn't write it, not our grant. I no, we have the, yeah. So I, I think I'm just raising the, the some of just the red flags on on yeah. it and, and connecting it to the broader conversation that the council and colleagues are having with respect to, to all of the monies, right, going in and out of the department. Um, Deputy Superintendent, do you want to add anything? No, she summed it up, but that it, yeah. it would continue as, as far as that communication aspect and meeting with groups and having those conversations, that would continue, obviously. Okay, um, do my colleagues have any more questions? And I'll, you know, look for the, the, the write-ups and the breakdowns to share with all council colleagues. Um, on all of these grants, um, including yeah. including this one. Oh, Councilor Mejia, or Councilor Flynn, I'm sorry, did I skip you? Did you have some additional questions? No, no, Councilor Campbell, thank you for your leadership on this, Councilor Campbell. 
Thank you. Uh, Council Mejia. Yes, yeah, so I'm just curious, um, would there be an opportunity to, um, I know the funds are allocated for a specific reason, but in the interest of just really trying to figure out how we build trust, is there a way for us to um, think about strategically how we can utilize these funds differently or no? Like we redirect gotta, them to something else? Yeah, redirect them yep. more, pouring into more intervention and prevention, um, maybe more trust building and less surveillance and things that are, you know, racially profiling, at least the, the, the sentiment is out here. I'm just curious, uh, Maria or, or Deputy Superintendent, if there's a way for us to reconsider how those funds are used. Well, at first blush, that would be a conversation we would have to have with the Mass State Police. If this was a multi-year grant, we could be more proactive about that conversation with them uh, in terms of a balance. Um, but I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And, and so again, that conversation, since it's their grant, would have to take place with the Mass State Police. And what's the time around that? Is, is it is it like we'll take this money, use it or lose it? We can't. Can we go back to them and say, hey, can we, I mean, like, can you provide some? Maria, I think it is worth worth engaging. I mean, I would be shocked, right? Based on previous grants we've received from them as pass throughs, if we can redirect those dollars to some of the other things we're trying to redirect funds from the overtime budget to, right? To Council Mejia's point, that's the ongoing conversation. How do we realize these savings to get it to community based organizations on the ground? who are really helping our police on the preventative side, right? Because they can't do it all. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth checking. And, and if we could send that as a follow-up, that'd be great. Um, you know, there's just gonna be major concerns. I can tell you with $300,000 going straight to overtime for the entire budget. I understand it's the state police just giving us their money for greater partnership. Wonderful, that's great. We don't like to turn money away, but I'm just giving that larger context from what what's, um, what sort of for consideration on our side, which of course is a little at, at moments, I think broader than, than what you guys are, are focused on, right? In terms of just getting dollars into a particular unit to do their job. Um, so that's worth asking. Sorry, Council Mejia, I took over for that because I think that's a critical question we ask for every grant. Council Mejia, you have more questions there? No, it was just a recommendation, Maria and Deputy Superintendent. And I really do think that we have an amazing opportunity to restore the trust in our community and if there's ways for us to be able to help support that work um, through this uh, particular grant, then I think that it will speak volumes to um, helping to support nonprofit organizations that um, can really help you all yeah. get these guns off our streets. Mm -hmm. That's right, thank you, Council Mejia, and thank you, Maria and Deputy Superintendent. And I'll also flag, you know, on the, whether, we, whether it's bias in policing, racial profiling, whatever it is, you know, the recent FIO data was very disturbing, right, to many, particularly when you saw the disparities go up. Um, and we know, just putting my former lawyer hat on, when you look at certain crime data, it's not just that black and brown people are committing crime in the city of Boston or, or, and that white residents aren't, for example, right? There's just a real, I think a real intentionality that we have to have with respect to um, policing, which I, I'm, I'm not trying to preach to the experts who do the work, but the data that we received was disturbing. And I think rather than just say that, there will be a hearing Council O'Malley and I will do next year that really tries to not only speak, look at the data, get the police department to also come in and talk about it, but then talk about what are the strategies we can use so that we don't continue to see that, right? We don't see 70% of our stops be of black residents when we're a quarter of the population and that may be more preventative things. That may be some changes in policy training pro practices. I don't know. That may be diversifying our pu public safety agencies, which is the uh, conversation we're going to have literally now um, in the second hearing coming up. Um, folks who are people of color from the community, who knows, but really exploring some strategies ar around that, that data. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe, Maria, of course, Deputy Superintendent, you'd be willing to participate in those conversations given your expertise in the department and in the community. So thank you all. Um, Councilor Flynn, it looks like you're all set. And thank you to my council colleagues for being here. Thank you, Council Mejia as well. Um, thank you to others from the administration, uh, the police department, as well as the fire department. And we will review the grants. I will get the rest of the information to my council colleagues and um, go from there. Madam this Chair? hearing is now, and oh, go ahead, Shane. I, mean, I, I want to get public testimony. God bless, oh my goodness. 
Yes. Do we have folks for public testimony? My apologies. Yes, we have one person waiting, waiting right now. I'll move them over. Thank you so much. Let me know, uh, Shane, when they're on. I don't see them just yet. Here we go. Okay. I am so sorry. That was just rude of me as the chair. So you have two minutes. If you could state your name for the record in affiliation and then your testimony for two minutes, um, that would be great. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Elijah Patterson and I live in Roxbury. Thank you. I'm um, sorry I was so rude and almost cut you off, Elijah. My apologies. Go right ahead. No problem. I wasn't going to let you miss the blue hand. <laughs> <laughs> Go so right ahead. I just, I just wanted to say on a, on a couple of these dockets, uh, 0999, um, we know that the Fusion Task Force and Brick, and I do appreciate your leadership. Um, Councillor Campbell on uh, looking at the numbers on the game database, but we know that when we give money to um, monitoring for quote terrorist or that being the implication on radiological threats, that it means more monitoring of our Muslim neighbors and immigrants from Muslim majority countries and other young men of color. And I just find that very concerning. And I wonder how, um, how cultural competency will be baked into the response and what that will mean for my neighbors who are people of color, who are Somali uh, immigrants. And then re with regard to uh, 1141, I just, uh, it's the bottom line, whether or not it comes out as a city operating budget, it's $300,000 for OT because once again, the Boston Police Department has failed to budget correctly. Um, they need to take into account the fact that crimes happen after midnight that they want to respond to. And they need to, um, I know that this money has not been spent yet. I know it would be coming from state troopers, but still uh, they need to be thinking about how they're using their hours and how they plan on building community trust. Councilors Campbell and Mejia both asked about that. And I don't believe we got a satisfactory answer. We heard about how people involved with community watch groups are responding. We did not hear about how people being targeted, young children, put into gang databases. We did not hear about how them and their families feel and how they will uh, respond to these things. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that those concerns are noted on the record. So I thank you for your time. No, thank you. And they absolutely will. And I appreciate you um, joining us at the beginning and staying to the end to raise those points up, which of course will be reflected in the record. Um, and um, I'll also make sure my council colleagues, of course, are made aware of all of, the th all of the things we discussed today, which is critically important. Thank you, Elijah. Stay safe and healthy. Uh, Shane, do we have anyone else for public testimony? Oh, we are all set. Okay. Um, thank you again to everyone uh, um, for being a part of this conversation. Thank you again to the administration. We will review all of this. I will make sure, of course, every council colleague has what we discussed along with um, other documents that you'll send over in terms of breakdowns through these grants. Um, and we will then go from there. So thank you all, stay safe and healthy, enjoy the holiday season um, and take care of yourselves. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>